Hello, my name's Sam Ord. I'm an intensive care doctor at Nepean Hospital in Sydney. And this is a lecture series on focused cardiac ultrasound. And in this lecture, we'll be discussing how to assess the right heart. And I guess the right heart in the past may have been thought of as the weak undecider of the left ventricle, more of a glorified vein than a decent ventricle. And I guess what I'd like to try and persuade you is that this is, uh, this is simply not true. And the right heart is a tremendously important part of uh, global cardiac function, and it needs to be assessed as part of every focused cardiac ultrasound study. The right heart is extremely important, and it can be affected by a wide range of pathologies, including everything from pulmonary or microthrombi that can occur and everything from ARDS to pulmonary embolism. Left ventricle dysfunction can directly affect the right heart, particularly if it's enlarged. Sepsis or endothelial dysfunction can all cause, uh, uh, can all cause increased pulmonary vascular resistance, which can increase RV afterload, leading to dysfunction. If you have any kind of capillary leak or hypovolemia or hypoxic vasoconstriction that can occur, Again, increasing up RV afterload by pulmonary, uh, by pulmonary venous uh, resistance. Ischemia, mechanical ventilation. These will all lead to some form of right ventricle dysfunction. I guess one way to try and think about it is if you do have uh, any kind of rising lactate that's out of keeping with some kind of systemic hemodynamics that you're looking at, if you're seizing, if seeing rising, liver, rising uh, liver function tests and you're seeing uh, liver dysfunction, any kind of acute renal impairment, I encourage you to get out the echo probe, stop giving fluids, and think about right ventricle dysfunction. The right ventricle is a bit like the left ventricle in that it's got a preload component, an afterload component, and a contractility component, all contributing to its overall function. Dysfunction can be associated with coronary artery disease, arrhythmias, and sepsis, just as it is with the left ventricle. But the right ventricle is special. The coronary artery perfusion for the right ventricle, it is perfused during diastole as well as systole, whereas it's predominantly during diastole with the left coronary. It's a highly compliant structure which means that uh, any change in volume and change in pressure will lead to changes in right ventricle size. And it's acutely affected by an increased pressure, such as come with uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. And increased pulmonary vascular resistance can occur with everything like hypoxia, acidosis, hypercapnia, or PEEP. We have these uh, innate uh, we have the innate response in our pulmonary vascular system that if we get any kind of hypoxia or hypercapnia, we can get reflex uh, vasoconstriction in those areas. And that's to direct blood away from areas of the lung which aren't uh, being oxygenated well. And that can, all, each of those will increase that pulmonary vascular resistance, which can increase the right ventricle afterload. PEEP can do the same thing. Um, PEEP, if, it, if you overexpand uh, alveoli, you can also look at uh, squashing that pulmonary uh, vascular tree as well. And by squashing that vascular tree, increasing pulmonary vascular resistance and RV afterload. But it is different if you're looking at acute versus chronic problems. The right ventricle, uh, the, the right ventricle that's been, that has chronically elevated pulmonary artery pressures you can have pressures in the right heart that are up to 70, 80, 90 millimeters of mercury that's peak systolic pulmonary artery pressures. Whereas if, you, if someone has a PE, for instance, you can start to get RV dysfunction if the pulmonary artery pressures get above 40 or 50. So again, it's the, uh, the timing of the onset of the raised uh, pulmonary artery pressures also contributes to RV dysfunction. Unfortunately, the right ventricle is not that easy to look at at times, and we do not have an echo parameter that is perfect for assessing right ventricle function. The left ventricle we're better at. We get an idea of that, that it's bullet-shaped and we can see it nicely. It's got a sort of more of a uh, uh, symmetrical 
structure, which means that we can make various geometrical assumptions, such as we're making with ejection fraction, and we can assume that it is kind of bullet shaped, and you can make an ejection, and you make an estimate of what ejection fraction is. The right ventricle has this complex position in that it sits wrapped around that left ventricle, and it's got this conical shape or triangular shape, and it's up underneath the sternum, so it's in a retrosternal position. All of it, which makes it hard to diagnose and hard to monitor. One of the things that is going in our favor, luckily, for the right ventricle, is that it's got a predominance of longitudinal motion. Now, in this three-dimensional image that you can see here, you can see that there is some sort of bellows motion, as in sort of inward motion that goes on with ventricle function. But the majority of that change in that uh, volume that's seen in this image is it, coming from the longitudinal motion. That's from the base where you've got the tricuspid annulus and pulmonary annulus moving towards the apex. And this means that we can look at uh, how far that uh, the tricuspid annulus, for instance, how far that annulus moves towards the apex and use that as an estimate of global uh, systolic function of that right ventricle. In terms of analyzing the right heart with focused cardiac ultrasound, we want to do similar assessments as we did for the left ventricle. We want to assess the right ventricle size, and we want to assess the right ventricle function. In terms of the right ventricle size, it is unfortunately more difficult than the left ventricle because there are some imaging problems, as we've, uh, as we've shown. And I think if you can just be able to assess whether it is grossly dilated or normal in size, that is adequate. In terms of the right ventricle function, we need to be able to say whether it is normal function or it's hyperdynamic or decreased function. I think it's much, much more difficult to say whether you've got either mild to moderately impaired or severely impaired dysfunction. I think that is extremely difficult with the right ventricle. I think if you can just say if it's got impaired function or normal function or hyperdynamic function, that is about as all you can hope for. There are a couple of extra things that we can assess with the right heart. We can look at the RV free wall thickness and we can look at the right atrial size. Both of these are important when you start to try and to assess the chronicity of maybe uh, if, they, if you do see right ventricle dilation and dysfunction. If you wanted to assess whether this is acute or chronic, one of the first ports of call to be look at that right ventricle free wall thickness. If it, is, if it is thickened, we can maybe assess that there is a chronic component to these raised right ventricle, and, uh, right ventricle pressures, which means that that's led to right ventricle free wall hypertrophy. Also, if the right atrial size is massively dilated, that would suggest that there's been significant tricuspid regurgitation, potentially. And that's led to a, a, a chronic change, and chronic remodeling has led to that rise in the right atrial size. These are not fundamental parts of the focused cardiac ultrasound. They're a bonus to be assessed, I think. And with relatively little training, you can start trying to assess for these things. The main thing you want to be assessing for in your study, though, is looking for that right ventricle size and that right ventricle function. Focus cardiac ultrasound does not use Doppler. And that means that we cannot assess right ventricle pressures. We cannot estimate the pulmonary hypertension or the peak systolic pulmonary artery pressures. We are not going to be able to exclude pathologies such as infective endocarditis. And we are not going to be able to evaluate valvular function. You can make an estimate of maybe what the valve appearance looks like, but the valve function involves the use of Doppler, and that is beyond the scope of focused cardiac ultrasound studies. In terms of imaging of the right ventricle, it is harder than the left ventricle. And there are a few really important points to try and remember. And when you start out doing focused cardiac ultrasound, I can guarantee that you are going to overcall the amount of right ventricle dilation you are going to see. And that's because it's really easy to make the right ventricle look bigger than it really is. I would encourage you to think, when you are training during this, uh, doing focused cardiac studies, if you see right ventricle enlargement, I would like your first thought to be is, am I imaging it badly? because you need to be aware of foreshortening. What foreshortening basically means is that if you are not imaging from the true apex in the apical four-chamber view, if you are imaging either one rib space too high or one rib space too low, you will be bisecting that ventricle at uh, an off-axis uh, level. You will be not looking down the barrel of the, of the heart. And that can make the right ventricle look large. 
So if you see right ventricle enlargement, I would like your first thought to be is, am I imaging off axis? Am I foreshortening that right ventricle? And that is what's making the heart look big. You should always be imaging at the apex. And then to try and make that right ventricle size assessment as accurately as possible, just with gentle rotation, anti-clockwise and clockwise, you make that right ventricle look as big as, it as big as you can, and then you make your assessment. And once again, same as with any other abnormality in the heart, if you see an abnormality in one view, you must try and see it in other views to confirm your finding. So this is what I mean for an example of, uh, of foreshortening. So on the left side here, we have a, a true apical view, where we have the left ventricle, the left atrium, the right atrium, and the right ventricle. The right ventricle is unfortunately always going to be harder to look at than the left ventricle because of its position and its retrosternal nature. But you can always sort of, you can, you can try to get an idea of what that size is, and you try to compare the size between uh, the ventricle and the, the other ventricle. And typically, as long as it's 60% the size of the left ventricle, that is a normal size. But let's have a look at this imaging. Now, what happens if I told you this is done in the same patient? What we can look in here is this right ventricle looks to be about the same size, if not bigger than the left ventricle. And you could be fooled into thinking that this is significantly dilated right ventricle. What I'm going to ask you to assess is that you look at the shape of it. Now, the shape of this heart is globular. It looks like a soccer ball. Whereas this, this heart looks more like a, a rugby ball. It looks uh, oval in shape. You want to try and make sure that your heart that you're looking at is as, uh, as long and thin as possible, not short and fat. Because long and thin means you are imaging down the gun barrel of that ventricle rather than off axis. Because in this one, the right ventricle looks big, when as a matter of fact, it is normal in size. Once you think you have a decent shot of the right ventricle, you can make some subjective assessments on the size of the right ventricle. And these are recommendations from the uh, American Society of Echocardiography. And you can make estimates of what the right ventricle size is by measuring the base, which is uh, lateral to medial tricuspid annulus at the mid ventricle level, and then finally uh, the base to apex length. And then using a reference range, you can get an idea of what the ventricle size is. This takes a bit of time. I think in terms of imaging and being off axis, it's very easy. I must admit this is not something I use regularly as part of my focus cardiac ultrasound. I mainly use the eyeballing method and assessing an com uh, a objective comparison between the right ventricle and left ventricle size. And I'd be wanting to say, is that a normal ventricle size? Does it look about 60% the size of that left ventricle as it does on this left image here? In which case, I'd say that is a normal left ventricle size, as opposed to this image on the right side, where we can see that this right ventricle looks to be maybe even bigger than that left ventricle size. And that would be a sign of severe right ventricle dilatation. And mild to moderate is somewhere in between. Again, just like the LV, you must assess the right ventricle in all views possible to try and make an estimate of what the right ventricle size and function is. In terms of uh, assessing the right ventricle systolic function, there are, a, there are a few ways that we can do it. From a subjective point of view, we can look at using what's known as TAPSI, or tricuspid annulus plane systolic excursion. All that means is that in the apical four-chamber view, you look at how far that tricuspid annulus moves with systole. And if it moves greater than 16 millimeters, that is normal. Fractional area change is a way of assessing the difference in the area of the right ventricle between systole and diastole, and if that area change is greater than 35%, that is normal. So the good thing about TAPSI is that it's easy, and it's something that I do as part of every study that I do. It's really important that you remember that, that you're really important to assess that you are sitting at the apex of the heart and you are not off axis and they were not, uh, it, you don't have an off-axis imaging plane, and therefore you can potentially have inaccuracies of actually assessing how far that uh, tricuspid annulus is moving towards the apex. But if you think you've got a decent apical four-chamber view, it's really simple. You just drop your imaging plane cursor down through that lateral tricuspid annulus, you press M mode, and you watch 
at how that lateral tricuspid annulus plane moves. And you measure from its peak to its base, and you can get an idea of what the tricuspid annulus plane systolic excursion is. And if it's greater than 16, it's normal. And it's easy, and it's been shown that it is repeatable amongst different users. And it's related to outcome in patients with uh, congestive, heart heart, congestive heart failure as well as pulmonary hypertension. But it's not perfect. It's very angle dependent, obviously. If you're imaging it off plane, you're not going to be assessing the true motion. We're assessing one point on that right ventricle and assessing its movement and from that estimating what the global systolic function is of a very complex uh, structure. And of course, there are going to be some limitations if you've got any kind of regional wall motion abnormality or abnormality in how you're imaging it. And that means that it lacks sensitivity, it's load dependent, and there are many other limitations. It's not perfect, but it is easy, and it does give you an overall idea, and it's probably one of the best and simplest things that we have access to with a focused cardiac ultrasound study. RV fractional error change is essentially rubbish. I think it is useless. It's not something that I do. This is how it's done. I think probably that's about enough to be said, to be honest. It's relatively simple, but it's extremely easy to get, uh, to get abnormal findings. Uh, it's, in terms of reproducibility, it's not as good as TAPSI, and I think its sensitivity has got some serious impairments, and this is not part of uh, my focus cardiac study or my formal study, um, but this is how it's done. So what is the best method for analyzing RV if I've told you that everything that we've got at our disposal is pretty rubbish? Well, the best thing's probably you, and you get used to uh, looking at right ventricles and you do enough of them, and you're going to get an idea of what significantly abnormal is and what normal is and what hyperdynamic is in terms of RV function. And it just takes a few studies. I think it probably takes around about 30. That's what the experts would agree to. That it, uh, you know, after you've done 30 focused studies, you're going to be able to have a good idea of what severe, significant uh, RV dysfunction and severe RV enlargement looks like. So have a look at this image. Uh, so what do you think about this uh, right ventricle function? It's, uh, we've got, uh, we're imaging the tricuspid annulus plane systolic excursion, or TAPSI, and we're seeing that it's 10 millimeters. So that's uh, RV dysfunction, right? Well, I think you've got to, again, just this is an example of off-axis imaging. If we have a look at our, our 2D image at the top here, we've just got a still, obviously, but we are, we're not imaging at the true apex. The true apex is somewhere over here. We're imaging off-axis at the moment, and that means that we won't be assessing how far that tricuspid annulus plane has gone. It's probably more in that direction there rather than in that direction. And this is an example of the uh, angle dependence uh, which is present when you're imaging for TAPSI. So let's talk, uh, talk about a, a few other things, like uh, RV free wall thickness. So it's a relatively simple measure to do. Um, I think it's just important to know the limitations involved, really. Um, so we're talking about trying to assess if the RV free wall is thickened or hypertrophy because of chronic elevation of pulmonary artery pressures, essentially. Um, we normally use the subcostal view. You can use a short axis view as well. Uh, you can measure it in your still of your 2D image or B-mode image. You can just measure a still there and just measure the wall thickness. Or you can drop a, a cursor down through it and measure your M-mode to try and assess it as accurately as possible. Um, the upper limit is 5 millimeters. And I, I guess my, my reservations about using this is our ability to differentiate between, say, 4 millimeters and 6 millimeters. I, I don't think it's fantastic with... Uh, a echo uh, phased array probe. I think uh, the sensitivity of this method has some issues. It is something that I do because again it can give you an idea. I just don't think it is the be all and end all. So in terms of a, a bit of pathology, we'll just talk about uh, important things to assess. Uh, one of these sort of extra, extra things to look at during your study is looking at ventricular interdependence. And what this essentially means is change in right ventricle pressure that occurs maybe during respiration or during the cardiac cycle. And if we're getting a flattening of this septum, and the flattening of the septum, as you can see up here, we've got this D shape to the septum. And that just means that you've got, instead of it being an O all the way through the cardiac cycle, we've got a D. And that D happens because at some stage during that cardiac cycle, the pressure in that right ventricle exceeds the pressure in the left ventricle. 
if that increase in pressure in the right ventricle happens during systole, so the pressure in the right ventricle during systole is greater than the pressure in the left ventricle during systole, so you get that D shape during systole, as we can see in this top example here, that can be an example of pressure overload, we describe it as. And that can come from things like pulmonary embolism, for example. And for maybe the observant of you, you can see here in the right ventricle, we have a structure that is flapping in and out the ventricle, and that's a thrombus that's sitting there in that right ventricle. And this would be an example of significant uh, clot load or clot burden that would be sitting in that pulmonary vascular tree. And we can see that we've got a D shape during systole. At the bottom here, we have a, quite a subtle sign of a D shape during diastole. So that means that the RV pressure during diastole is going to be greater than the, RV, the, greater than the LV pressure during diastole. And again, the observant of you might be able to see that we've got a huge right ventricle there. That right ventricle area here is larger than the left ventricle. Now, I agree, we may be off axis a little bit. Maybe there's a bit of an oval shape to that, sh uh, to the, to that, um, uh, to that uh, short axis of the left ventricle. But be that as it may, we've still got an enormous right ventricle. And if you have uh, flattening of that septum during diastole, that's a, that's a sign of considering volume overload. I'd like to give a couple of slides uh, sort of to finish up talking about pulmonary embolus. I think when I started doing focused cardiac studies, I thought ultrasound was going to be the answer to diagnosing pulmonary embolism. And unfortunately, it's not. I think it can be extremely difficult to diagnose uh, this pathology sometimes. And uh, the gold standard will probably always remain, you know, CTPA. For me, a focused cardiac ultrasound is an extension of examination. And just the same as examination has some limitations when you're trying to, uh, when you have pulmonary embolus in your differential diagnosis, and there are some limitations with examination, there are some limitations with echo. Unless you can see that there is an intraventricular thrombus throwing around, like in that previous example I showed you, you're not going to be able to confirm that there's a pulmonary embolus. There are many different things that can cause right ventricle enlargement and right ventricle dysfunction. And our ability to differentiate between the chronicity or the timing that something has happened, I, I think is difficult. I think at best, echo is going to be able to support the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and maybe increase your uh, increase your sort of certainty of being able to make the diagnosis. I think it is very rarely that it's going to be able to clinch the diagnosis completely for you. It's going to add to your uh, ability to, to, I think it'd be add to your ability to have it uh, on your differential diagnosis. You know, if you see a RV enlargement and you see RV decrease function and you're seeing acute onset of chest pain with some desaturation, of course you're going to have pulmonary embolus in your diagnosis. And having the echo there showing that you've got RV dilation and RV dysfunction increases the certainty. But there are many things that can cause it. If you've got chronic pulmonary hypertension and you've got a bit of pericardial, uh, pericardial inflammation, you can get similar in, in an elderly patient. You know, you're still going to have desaturation and chest pain. I guess all I'm trying to say is that you've got to put it into clinical context. Uh, I think you, pulmonary embolism, more than any other uh, more than any other disease with uh, focused cardiac ultrasound, it's all about putting your findings into clinical context, discussing it with your senior, considering doing formal ultrasound uh, examinations uh, to try and assess the right ventricle size and function. I think it's very important to have all of these things together before you start making a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And certainly, just because you see a right ventricle enlargement with some dysfunction does not mean that you thrombolize someone, obviously. So this is an example of someone who does have pulmonary embolism. You can see that they are tachycardic. On this parasternal long axis view, you can see that there is a huge right ventricle, and it's squashing that interventricle septum over into that left ventricle, and it's happening during systole, and it is almost causing near obliteration of that left ventricle cavity size. In the short axis view, you can see the right ventricle enlargement compared to the left ventricle cavity size. You can see that D-shaped septum. And in the apical four-chamber view, you can see that ventricular interdependence very nicely. And you can see that that right ventricle is bigger than the size of that left ventricle, all suggesting that, uh, that you've got right ventricle enlargement. And if you can imagine 
uh, if there was tapsy that was done here, you can imagine it being very small. But just even from eyeballing it, you can see that that free wall is not moving well at all. All of a sign, all signs of right ventricular enlargement, right ventricle uh, decreased function, and putting into clinical context with someone uh, who's got off a plane recently, who's got a history of uh, having their leg in plaster or something in their hypercoagulable state or something, and they're breathless with chest pain, you've got to be thinking that you need to be arranging a CTPA as urgently as possible to try and diagnose the PE. I guess this echo does not diagnose PE, but it sure as hell supports the diagnosis for it. So, in conclusion, with the right ventricle assessment, many disorders can result in RV enlargement and dysfunction, such as pulmonary hypertension. There can be a chronicity to it. You can, of course, get acute right ventricle enlargement and dysfunction, but there are many disorders that can cause chronic RV dysfunction. ECHO rarely diagnoses pulmonary embolism. It simply helps provide the evidence for it, and it will help your ability to form your conclusions. And if you are going to think that there is RV enlargement or RV dysfunction, multiplane assessment is needed. And above all, just be make sure that you're watching for off-axis imaging. And I encourage you that if you see right ventricle enlargement, your first thought should be, is am I imaging it appropriately? Am I imaging it absolutely at the apex and I'm looking down the gun barrel? Or am I off-axis? In which case, I could be overestimating the size of my right ventricle. You try and make that heart look as long and thin as possible, like a rugby ball not short and fat like a soccer ball. Thank you very much. I hope this was useful. <laughs>